You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. Most writers and radio show hosts know that to connect with your fans, you need to do more than just write books or record the latest podcasts. There are many different elements that go into forming an online platform, but there are also many hidden traps. To make matters worse, solid advice on how to survive the muddy waters is scarce. In the book Hidden Traps, I talk about some of the important issues of working with an online platform, highlighting traps that could put your physical or internet security at risk or be harmful to your reputation. Are your social media posts just links with a few disjointed words making you look like someone who can't complete a sentence? Did your new website cost you more than you anticipated? Are you leaking your personal contact details across the web without even knowing it? Then you need Hidden Traps. Although Hidden Traps is not officially released until August 1st, you can pre-order your paperback or ebook copy now from a variety of retailers, including Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and Kobo. Visit BlackWolfPublications.com for more details. Here's George Foreman with InventHelp. Hi, I'm George Foreman. Do you have an idea for a new product or invention? People ask me all the time, George, how do I get my idea in front of companies? How do I get a patent? What do I do next? Do you have the same questions? I'll tell you like I'll tell them all. Call my friends at InventHelp. Call InventHelp today for free information. InventHelp has been helping inventors for more than 30 years and has sales offices nationwide. InventHelp can submit your invention to companies who are interested in receiving new ideas. If you have an idea and want to try to patent it and submit it to companies, you should call InventHelp today for free information. Listen, I can't guarantee a company will be interested in your idea, but I believe every inventor deserves the opportunity to step into the ring and take their best shot. Put InventHelp in your corner. To get your free inventor's information, call 1-800-353-6490. That's 1-800-353-6490. Again, 1-800-353-6490. KLRN Radio has advertising rates available. We have rates to fit almost any budget. Contact us at advertising at klrnradio.com. This is Slickery Trigger for Rebel Road Tactical. With proper care and feeding, your pistol will be ready when you need it. There to save your life. Shouldn't your gear be that good? Whether you need a holster for comfortable, everyday carry, or a tough-as-nails holster for your next training course, Rebel Road Tactical has what you need. Check us out on the web at rebelroadtactical.com. Tired of paying outrageous prices for Viagra? Well, we have great news for you. Now you can finally get Viagra at huge discounts. Healthy Man allows you to save up to $500 on Viagra. Why pay U.S. pharmacy prices of $15 per pill or more when you can get Viagra for less than $3 a pill? Call today and get 40 Viagra pills for only $99. This can cost as much as $600 at your local pharmacy. You can't afford not to call us. If you want Viagra at the lowest prices, never pay $15 a pill pharmacy prices again. Get Viagra for less than $3 a pill. Call 1-800-516-7602 today and save up to $500 and get 40 pills for just $99. Healthy Man is fast, easy, and affordable. Operators are waiting at 1-800-516-7602 to take your call right now. Call 1-800-516-7602. That's 1-800-516-7602. Again, 1-800-516-7602. If you're 85 or younger, would you like peace of mind and comfort for your family? We're Final Expense Direct with an urgent message for you. The average funeral today costs over $8,000, but the most you'll get from government benefits is $255. How will your family pay the difference? We can help. Our senior plans start as low as just a dollar a day and pay up to $30,000 for a funeral and other final expenses. Peace of mind is easy. There's no medical exam. You'll have lifetime coverage, and your plan can't be canceled as long as you pay your premiums. Call now for free information about our senior plans. Answer a few simple questions and receive approval right on the phone. 
Plus, call right now and we'll give you a discount prescription card for free. Call 800-553-8687. That's 800-553-8687. Again, 800-553-8687. You're listening to the Spark Radio Network, Internet radio like you've never heard before. Innovation, creativity, and imagination are all said to begin with a spark. So fasten your seatbelt and take the ride of your life and listen for the spark. You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. My name is Jesse. I'm a United States Special Forces widow. This gives me a unique perspective on the world around us. If you're willing to listen, I'll tell you how I see it, and I won't pull any punches. This is my POV, which stands for Point of View. All right, this is Jesse. How y'all doing out there today? You know I miss you when we're not talking. All right. I'm not alone tonight. I got a guest. Yeah, I know, a guest on a weeknight. But Justin's just awesome like that. How you doing, Justin? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on tonight. Oh, anytime, and you know it, darling. So, just remind people who you are. Please tell them your primary areas of interest and just a little bit about you. Uh, sure. Uh, so, my primary area of interest is, is in terrorism. I'm currently working on a, a doctorate degree in, in that area. Uh, my specialties would be radicalization, recruitment, uh, those those type of things from a psychological perspective of essentially why do people do bad things, uh, but from a terrorist uh, kind of a perspective on that. Sounds fascinating to me, but then you know I can, I take the interest in all these little tiny things, you know, like before we came on the air, I was like, did you hear this sound clip? You've got to listen to the sound clip. What do you think about it? You know, I'm always running off. I'll find some little thing and I don't know if I'm blowing it up, making a mountain out of a molehill or or what? So, there has been, since we last spoke on the air, there's been a lot that's happened. They've liberated Mosul. Now, I wanted to get your take on that. Do you think Mosul's really pretty much dash free? Well, you know, all the reports are that it probably is. Uh, I mean, I'm, with, with anything, it's a fairly decent sized city. It was probably a few small people hang, still hanging around, but it certainly sounds like they've pretty much cleared the city of it. Uh, now, of course, that doesn't mean it will stay that way necessarily. We'll have to kind of keep an eye on it. It will certainly won't be an easy task to hold it. Uh, but at least for, for the moment, they appear to have uh, completely cleared it out. Oh, well, that's... Hey, that's something. I mean, because... It is. I mean, it was certainly a costly uh, mission. You know, the city has essentially been reduced to rubble in a lot of places, um, you know, completely destroyed, you know, housing and everything. Uh, but they did seem to manage to get them out. So, so I guess that, that would be considered a victory. Yeah. Uh, and Dash blew up the uh, mosque in the minaret. Mm-hmm. Th- that had to hurt the local populace. It really did. Oh, yeah, I have to imagine it It definitely did. I think that was the biggest psychological wound. Well, that that is something that uh, ISIS or Daesh has has really focused on, these kind of psychological things, destroying uh, places of worship, destroying ancient relics, you know, uh, or ancient archaeological sites, all these things that hold a lot of meaning to people you know, kind of in a symbolic sense, too. And they've been kind of going through and wiping a lot of that out, which is mostly symbolic. You know, it doesn't hurt anybody to, to you know, to blow up an archaeological dig, but it certainly has a huge symbolic importance that, that plays on people's minds psychologically. I can imagine. I can imagine. Because I know that one of the things that brings me comfort and makes me feel at peace are some of the nation's most famous landmarks. The Tomb of the Unknown, uh, Washington Monument, Statue of Liberty. 
Absolutely. I mean, those, those are things that have been, kind of been etched in the landscape of, of our country, in particular certain cities. Uh, and when, you, when you know, a, a group comes through and tries to destroy those like they did in Mosul and other places, you know, that, that is a huge psychological impact on somebody destroying a, a cultural symbol of, of that city. Yeah, it, I'm sure it was a very hard thing for them, and I'm sure many people wept over it. So, oh, sure. yeah. for now, Mosul is, well, not necessarily safe to live in, because, well, it's rubble, but, ter- shall we say, dash-free or ISIS-free? And for those of you regular listeners, dash, ISIS, and ISIL, they all mean the same thing. ISIS just happens to like the acronym DASH the, the least, so that's the one your host chooses to use. Yeah, I, th- I think it's fair to say that they're, they're, they're li- at least free of, of them. I guess it's probably not the safest place to live still, um, and it probably won't be for quite a while, but they can say that they've, they've rid, rid them of that group. Well, that's one thing for sure. All right, so what did you think when on our nation's Independence Day, North Korea launched an ICBM? Mm-hmm. You know, it's... Um... It's tricky because so much of, of what North Korea does is this kind of show of bravado, trying to prove, hey, we can do this. Um, but at the moment, it's, it still has to be mostly signaling. It, it's kind of this this idea that uh, they they want to join the world powers, but we also kind of know that they can't really do a whole lot about it. They're a small enough country with enough enemies that if they actually did something, uh, they launched a, mission, uh, you know, a, a missile at the U.S., that country would be obliterated within you know a couple hours at most, probably faster than that. So there's still kind of this, uh, this destruction element that they know an attack would be suicide for them. And as, as crazy as, as the Kim family seems to be at times, they're not suicidal, at least from what we can tell. Um, I doubt he, he wants to continue ruling. He doesn't want to die. He, he's, he's not a terrorist like you know Dash or ISIS would be in a, and that they're willing to die. He has a very different psychological uh, mindset where he, he enjoys the power. So I don't really see them using it. But at the same time, um, having that capability is, is certainly concerning, uh, especially if, if China and Russia kind of continue to, to back them. Um, now, obviously, they're not you know, the best of friends, but they are probably the best friends that North Korea has. And, and with, if they continue to have that communist backing, um, socialist backing from the U.S. Uh, from the from Russia, uh, that certainly makes them a, a bigger player on on the on the world stage. And it's still concerning, even if they can't really use it at this point, um, with without committing suicide, essentially. Well, I gotta say, I actually made a comparison. I combined North. I compared North Korea one night live on air to a cross between the mafia and a terrorist group. Um, And here's my reasoning behind this. They are, they essentially dumped a more dead than alive person on us in terms of Otto Warmbier. So Mm -hmm. that sounded like a mafia tactic to me. Because it just isn't, what I'd call a normal terrorist tactic. But then they go, but then they go and do 300 public executions in one day to terrorize their own people. Because that's how Kim Jong-un stays in power by keeping people so scared to look up. Right. I mean, in general, there's two ways to rule. Either you're, you're loved by people or you're hated or feared, I guess. And um, he's definitely chosen the fear side of that. And so that's why I said there's, 
that's why that's kind of what I was going off of is that you know they keep their people so terrified which to invoke terror I, correct me if I'm wrong here Justin definition of terrorism to cause terror yeah I mean they, they want to create a creative a perception of fear so but, you know the North Korean regime does definitely have certain elements that that ring true with the terrorist groups um but they they lack that um willing willing to die element oh yeah they're not willing to die for their cause they're 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 not ideological uh per se they're they're political in nature like purely political it's all about maintaining power they're not super concerned about the ideology of what they're doing Uh, they're not fighting for a, a religion necessarily or or you know not fighting for I mean, they're not even fighting for communism or anything like that. They're, they're literally fighting to stay in power, and that's why he does what he does. So it's, it has a lot of differences, too. I guess that's where the mafia comparison could potentially come in. Well, plus, dumping a dead body on the doorstep sounds like something you'd read in a mob book. Or see on, you know, Sonny, see Sonny Corleone or one of those mobsters doing. I mean, tell me that doesn't sound like a plot out of a... A mob book. It does. It does kind of sound like a tactic they would use. Now, I mean, North Korea obviously has claimed that that you know it wasn't their fault, which isn't really a mob tactic. Usually, they want people to know what they did. Um, but it's certainly, I mean, obviously they, they did something. Uh, whatever you know, they they did to him, you know, beat him into a coma, essentially. Uh, that's that's certain. And and, and then they, like I said, they dropped him on our doorstep. That's certainly a, a a mob-like tactic. Right. So that, that that's what I said about them. So, all right. For those of you who are, list, are are tuning in for the first time, you know, not only am I a Special Forces widow, I remarried an active duty service member. Now, Justin, you might know the answer to this, but do, in fact, do you know where Dave Brewer, my husband, is serving right now? Uh... No, I don't, I don't think so. Korea. Really? Yes, and he was there when Fourth of July, when on Fourth of July, when Kim Jong Un decided to add his own fireworks to the show. Oh wow! Yeah, which was pretty interesting because uh, that was literally his reaction. And for someone who wears the uniform is on the peninsula where things, if they go wrong, they are going to go very, very wrong. Let's just face that one. Mm -hmm. I mean... Well, that's, I mean, that's also the kind, kind of the biggest bargaining chip that they have right now is South Korea. Right, because they have hundreds right. of thousands of, tra of standard artillery units trained on Seoul. Right, and even if you know we were to attack them, they could pretty quickly launch that attack on South Korea, and thousands to millions would die, and we wouldn't really be able to stop that. And that, that's that's their biggest bargaining chip that they have, and probably the biggest reason that you know that we haven't done anything more about them over over the you know, the, the decades that they've that the Kim family's been in power. That's prob you're probably right because well. We don't want to see Seoul reduced to rubble like Mosul. No, I mean, South Korea is a hugely important ally for us in, in, in Asia, particularly being kind of on, on the back door of, of China, right right there on the same, same continent. They're so close. It gives us kind of that extra foothold there. So they, they've been very important allies, and we really don't want to see anything happen to, to them. Well, that makes sense. Now... Do you know who Nor some of North Korea's most prolific trading partners are, Justin? Uh, well, I know they've done a fair amount of business in the Middle East with, with Iran, um, in, in addition to, obviously, China, Russia. Okay, you, you hit the top three. Now, there are some others that they trade with, but they're not what I'd call uber-major. But they, North Korea also, in the past few months, I couldn't put a date on it, started a ferry 
it's either once or twice a week between North Korea and Vladivostok, Russia. Really? Yeah, you want to bet there's more than tourists on that on that ferry? Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me. Me either. So what I found interesting was, okay, you've got, we just mentioned North Korea, China, and Russia, and Iran, all in one breath, right? Mm hmm Now, take a look at Iran. Do you know who one of their biggest trading partners, who their, two of their biggest trading partners are? Uh, well, it would be Russia would be one of them. Um, uh, I mean... China. I don't, I don't know beyond that. China, China would be up there as well. China is getting ready to dump tens of millions of dollars into Iran's infants, infrastructure as part of their One Belt, One Road, or New Silk Road, as many people are calling it, project. And they said Ar Iran oh, well. is the, the key to it all because of the one thing that drives everything, location, location, location. Yeah, and the countries in the Middle East are prime locations for a lot of countries trying to gain footholds there. So, now we have China getting ready to go into Iran and upgrade their infrastructure. Because now they can, because the Iran nuclear deal dropped the sanctions. Right, yeah. And so I'm just sitting here going, why do I keep tripping over the same three or four countries with everything? Well, you know, a lot of that probably goes back to the days of the Cold War when there were essentially two sides. You know, there was the West, you know, that had to headed by kind of the U.S., but it included most of Europe and some other places as well, and then you had the the, the communist bloc, which is Russia, China, uh, you throw Cuba in there, and then some of some of their allies as well. And we're still kind of seeing the the ramifications of that even after the Cold War is you know, long since over. There's still kind of two you know opposing blocks. So you have kind of the West, U.S., Europe, and you have kind of that that the East, you know, China, Russia, Iran, North Korea. Uh, throw in, you know, a few other countries in there as well, but it's still kind of this, the separation into the two large groups. I hadn't looked at it that way, but it does put it in a new perspective. It's just one of those things of, I'll, I'll run into a story and depending on what country the story is about, it's like, all right, here's one of you. Where are the other two or three? So, speaking of Iran, I do have a news article on them. Let me find it. And yes, folks, even with Justin on, show prep, just not as much. <laughs> Still got to have something to talk about, friends. All right, here we go. Iran successfully tested a rocket that can deliver satellites into orbit. Iranian state television showed footage of the rocket of the firing of the rocket mounted on a launch pad carrying pictures of Ayatollah Khomeini. Ayatollah Rulaha Rullah, Khomeini, founder of the Islamic Republic and supreme leader Ayatollah Ali Khomeini. The rocket launch violated United Nations Security Council Resolution 2231 according to the United States Spokes Department spoke United States State Department spokeswoman Heather Noort. The resolution, which endorsed a 2015 nuclear deal bef between Iran and the, and the P5 plus one, calls upon Iran not to undertake activities related to ballistic missiles capable of delivering nuclear warhead, nuclear weapons, including, of course, launches using such technology. It stops short of explicitly barring such activity. Now, first of all, Justin, you know my opinion on the Iran nuclear deal, right? Yeah, I think I have an idea. Not worth the paper it's printed on? 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. Got more loop, more holes and good quality Swiss cheese, my friend. So, you know what I'm probably going to say about this launch and the UN resolution. But, what? Okay, so we've got the Iran rocket test. We have, now, North Korea has proliferated every weapon system they've ever developed. And Iran looks like they're pretty close to an ICBM too, because what, I don't know, I don't know if you know this, but I actually, well, I borrowed some knowledge from Doc, Judy, and found out who has what satellites that are commercially, that publicly listed satellites anyway, in orbit. She told me the website to go to. North Korea has two. So we don't know what they're doing. But we know that they're up there. And they were launched about two or three years ago. Mm -hmm. Now, if North Korea was launching satellites into space two or three years ago, and now they launched an ICBM that is capable of hitting Alaska, according to the experts, how long is it before Iran has an ICBM on the launch pad? Well, with the, the rate that... North Korea seems to pass along information. I can't imagine it's it's too far behind. I don't think so either. I, I'm, I'm just waiting for the day. I mean, and if people don't realize that Iran has sold the nuclear technology, they have sold every single weapon system they've ever developed. And I don't remember if I've got the audio for it. I'm going to take a quick lift look, and if I can't find it, we will roll on. This was one from Dumford. I don't remember what it was on, but it is North Korea related. So we're going to take a quick listen. And that's Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General Dunford. Threat that we face. So let me ask you a couple of questions about North Korea. Um, can you put to rest their concerns it's not the right clip, but I'll let it play anyway. About the immediacy of the North Korean threat. Sure. Uh, I mean, look, when, when we look at the path of capability development North Korea has been on, they conducted 16 uh, missile tests last year, two nuclear tests in 2016, and I think it's 75% uh, more that Kim Jong-un has conducted than his father, his predecessor. So they're clearly on a path to develop an intercontinental ballistic missile that can reach the United States and to match that with a nuclear weapon. So am I concerned? Absolutely. Do we need to deal with that? Absolutely. What I can tell the American people today is that, you know, what the North Koreans are capable of today is a limited missile attack. And we are capable of defending against a limited missile attack for our forces in South Korea, our South Korean allies, our Japanese allies, our forces in Okinawa, our forces in Guam, and the American homeland and Hawaii, to include Hawaii. So we can deal with a limited attack. All right, so that wasn't the clip I was looking for. But I thought it was, personally, I was, and I'm sure that was the impact intended, but General Dunford did reassure the American people, South Korea and Japan, that we can deal with a limited missile attack that North Korea is capable of. Mm -hmm. So do you think that was his goal, was to kind of reassure everybody and calm them down and pat them on the head and go, it's okay, we got your back? Yeah, I, I, I think absolutely it was. Um, I mean, I think a lot of people freak, freaked out about the North Korea thing. I think a lot of his goal is simply to, you know, to just, calm, you know, as, you, as you kind of said, calm people down. Um, just, just kind of tell them this is this isn't as big of a deal as we thought. We can we can handle it. You know, if they try something, and to just try to to ease some of those those concerns. I'd agree. I'd agree. But, I mean, he did go on to say that it doesn't matter. That his job is to basically plan for North Korea now and North Korea six months from now and six years from now. So, mm -hmm. you know, I can understand his perspective here. Now, Justin, I think we're going to have to pick this up on the other side, because guess what time it is? Time for a commercial break. 
You got it. You want to remind everybody where they can catch up with you when you're not on the air hanging out with me? Uh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so there's really two great ways you can reach me. I have a Twitter account, and that's uh, Justin R underscore Kenny. You can absolutely reach me there. And then I also have a, a Facebook page. Uh, you can reach me, and my, my page there is actually under my, my author name, which is J. Robert Kenny. All right, and as always... You can catch me on Twitter at Jesse's POV. You can catch me, email me at the station, Jesse's POV at KLRNRadio.com. And you can catch me in the chat room when I am live. That's KLRNRadio.com slash chat. And I will see you on the other side. You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. Most writers and radio show hosts know that to connect with your fans, you need to do more than just write books or record the latest podcasts. There are many different elements that go into forming an online platform, but there are also many hidden traps. To make matters worse, solid advice on how to survive the muddy waters is scarce. In the book Hidden Traps, I talk about some of the important issues of working with an online platform, highlighting traps that could put your physical or internet security at risk or be harmful to your reputation. Are your social media posts just links with a few disjointed words making you look like someone who can't complete a sentence? Did your new website cost you more than you anticipated? Are you leaking your personal contact details across the web without even knowing it? Then you need Hidden Traps. Although Hidden Traps is not officially released until August 1st, you can pre-order your paperback or ebook copy now from a variety of retailers, including Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and Kobo. Visit BlackWolfPublications.com for more details. Here's George Foreman with InventHelp. Hi, I'm George Foreman. Do you have an idea for a new product or invention? People ask me all the time, George, how do I get my idea in front of companies? How do I get a patent? What do I do next? Do you have the same questions? I'll tell you like I'll tell them all. Call my friends at InventHelp. Call InventHelp today for free information. InventHelp has been helping inventors for more than 30 years and has sales offices nationwide. InventHelp can submit your invention to companies who are interested in receiving new ideas. If you have an idea and want to try to patent it and submit it to companies, you should call InventHelp today for free information. Listen, I can't guarantee a company will be interested in your idea, but I believe every inventor deserves the opportunity to step into the ring and take their best shot. Put InventHelp in your corner. Get your free inventor's information. Call 1-800-353-6490. That's 1-800-353-6490. Again, 1-800-353-6490. KLRN Radio has advertising rates available. We have rates to fit almost any budget. Contact us at advertising at klrnradio.com. This is Slickery Trigger for Rebel Road Tactical. With proper care and feeding, your pistol will be ready when you need it. There to save your life. Shouldn't your gear be that good? Whether you need a holster for comfortable, everyday carry, or a tough-as-nails holster for your next training course, Rebel Road Tactical has what you need. Check us out on the web at rebelroadtactical.com. Tired of paying outrageous prices for Viagra? Well, we have great news for you. Now you can finally get Viagra at huge discounts. Healthy Man allows you to save up to $500 on Viagra. Why pay U.S. pharmacy prices of $15 per pill or more when you can get Viagra for less than $3 a pill? Call today and get 40 Viagra pills for only $99. This can cost as much as $600 at your local pharmacy. You can't afford not to call us. If you want Viagra at the lowest prices, never pay $15 
$3 a pill pharmacy prices again. Get Viagra for less than $3 a pill. Call 1-800-516-7602 today and save up to $500 and get 40 pills for just $99. Healthy Man is fast, easy, and affordable. Operators are waiting at 1-800-516-7602 to take your call right now. Call 1-800-516-7602. That's 1-800-516-7602. Again, 1-800-516-7602. If you're 85 or younger, would you like peace of mind and comfort for your family? We're Final Expense Direct with an urgent message for you. The average funeral today costs over $8,000, but the most you'll get from government benefits is $255. How will your family pay the difference? We can help. Our senior plans start as low as just a dollar a day and pay up to $30,000 for a funeral and other final expenses. Peace of mind is easy. There's no medical exam. You'll have lifetime coverage, and your plan can't be canceled as long as you pay your premiums. Call now for free information about our senior plans. Answer a few simple questions and receive approval right on the phone. Plus, call right now, and we'll give you a discount prescription card for free. Call 800-553-8687. That's 800-553-8687. Again, 800-553-8687. You can lay it down if you want to. You can run away if you want to. You can pretend that this is totally okay if you want to. You can play it dead if you want to. Forget what they say and if you want to. Turn your back on the country. Thank y'all for hanging in there with me while we paid those radio station bills. Yes, gotta pay the bills even in radio, folks. And yes, Justin, thank you. You are still with us. I always appreciate having you on the air. It makes my night so much easier having somebody else to chat with. I'm glad to be here. Oh, especially somebody with your background, because you can explain the psychology behind things like like the the mosque in Mosul being destroyed and why they would destroy a building. Now, speaking of mosques, there's another mosque that's been in the news lately. The Al-Aqsa Mosque. Now, for those of you who don't know what I mean by the Al-Aqsa Mosque, this is the mosque at the Temple Mount or the rock or the or the basically it's in it's the mosque in Jerusalem on the most disputed Square mile of real estate on the planet, my friends. Wouldn't you say that's about right, Justin? Oh, uh, absolutely. Yeah, and that that Temple Mount in particular is massively disputed by a variety of different groups. Uh, although, obviously, um, Islam and and Judaism are probably the, the two primary ones. Like I said, most disputed piece of real estate in the world. So, all right. Just to remind people of what's been going on at the Al-Aqsa Mosque, there were some police officers that, was, that were ambushed because, well, they didn't have metal detectors or any special security to get in because it was a place of worship. And Israel doesn't particularly like weapons in their places of worship, and they figure you'll be good and behave because you're supposed to be there for worship. So then there were some police officers that were injured, and then they shut down the mosque for Friday pep. Prayers. Now, what kind of impact would that have on the Muslim population, Justin? Well, it was, I mean, you can, you can, you can kind of look at it. It was a fairly big deal. They were not happy about it. Uh, it's, uh, the, the Al-Aqsa Mosque is, I believe it's the third holiest site in all of Islam. Yes. Um, and as you said, it sits, it sits on this, this piece of real estate that's been hotly contested and by a variety of different groups, so it's a it's a holy location, a holy site. Uh, so shutting down the mosque, you know, right in the middle or right, I guess, before prayers, was a, was a pretty big deal. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but Friday is the most uh, is the day that most Muslims go to pray. I mean, there may be prayer services other days of the week, but Friday's the big one. Yeah, Friday Friday is their big day. Okay, just want to make sure I got my religion straight here, my friend. So then Israel came back and said, okay, nobody under 50. Well, they didn't take that too kindly either. Then Israel said, fine, 
Everybody can come back, but we got metal detectors installed now. That didn't go over well, did it? No, that uh, was uh, very poorly received, uh, not just in Jerusalem either. We saw you know, riots in other places. I believe the Israeli embassy in Turkey was, was attacked uh, over this uh, and several other places as well. So it had impact beyond just Jerusalem. All right, so then Israel has agreed to withdraw the metal detectors. Now, they haven't pulled them yet, but they've said, we'll get to it. First of all, I love Israel. I am Jewish. But I don't think they're going to be in any hurry to pull out those metal detectors. But they've said they're going to replace them with something else more high-tech. I keep picturing the body scanners from the airport there, Justin. Oh, TSA. <laughs> yeah, TSA to go to the mosque. I don't think that would go over so, so well. Do you? No, I, I don't think so. Um, they have didn't, I obviously didn't respond well to the metal detectors. I can't imagine they're going to respond well to anything else. Uh, I mean, the, the if you're following the scenes today, you know, very chaotic when they uh, opened that that last gate, uh, and you know, the the crowds were chanting, "We will we'll, we'll sacrifice ourselves, you know, for Al Aqsa, the mosque." Um, I, I can't imagine this was a this this crowd would would welcome some sort of TSA-like device? No, I don't think they're going to either. I mean, now, this brings us to, like I said, the most disputed square mile of real estate on the planet. Maybe a little more, maybe a little less. That's just my way of classifying it. Now, of course, Israel says the metal detectors are a normal, everyday security tool, and opposition to their use was just an excuse to incite violence against Israel. So, of course... Yeah, and and, and, they've they've used them for years for other people, too. I mean, I, I visited the Temple Mount a few years ago, and I had to go through a metal detector. Um, so it's not like this is a brand new thing. It's just new for the Muslims uh, to to get onto the site. Right. And so, of course, the Temple Mount, or the Islamic name is Haram Esh Sharif. I hope I'm pronouncing that one right. If I'm not, feel free to correct me, Justin. I wouldn't know. That's my best, best guesstimate. So it's considered sacred by Jews, Muslims, and Christians. Jews, because it was the site of the temple. Muslims say it's where Muhammad ascended into heaven. And Christians, because, well, it's a Jewish site and Christians have their their roots in Judaism. That about sum it up? Yeah, I think that's that's a pretty good way to put it. All right. So they installed the detectors at entry points to Al-Aqsa Mosque compound in Jerusalem after two police guards were fatally shot July 14th. Now... The Palestinian leadership said that metal detectors have to be removed so things can go back to normal in Jerusalem. And we're not going to deal with bilateral relations until they're gone. First of all, if everybody else is already having to deal with metal detectors, what's the big deal? You put your car... You can put your house key in the little bowl. I mean, I go through metal detectors. You know, there's some, you go into a federal courthouse and chances are to get any, too far inside the door, you've got to go through a metal detector. You go to visit Congress as a tourist. I'm willing to bet you go through some kind of screening. Oh, yeah, you absolutely do. I've I've visited, you go through a metal detector. (laughs) See? I mean, what? I mean, personally, I don't see a big deal. So why would the Muslims, Palestinian authority, be so outraged? 
You got well, the insights. I, I would think it's, pro- it's probably a symbolic thing at first and foremost. You know, it, this idea that when you start putting up metal detectors, there's an element of distrust. I think that's that certainly is a good place to start. Um, I think there's also a, an element where they they believe they can they control it. This is their their land. They should be able to do what they want with it. Um, and there's probably several other things as well, but I think those are, are good places to start uh, to understand some of this um, animosity about it. Now, King Abdullah of Jordan has asked Pres- uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu to remove the quote-unquote causes of the tension. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to say the metal detector is not really the root cause of the tension. It's the fact that three people are claiming the same square, well, two primary face and a third, the third being Christianity, are all trying to claim the same square mile. And the Jews don't want to give it up, and the, and the Palestinians don't want to give it up. Nobody's willing to play nice. Yeah, I, th- I think that's probably a, a good observation. I mean, the, the response to metal detectors has been way over the top for what you would think for, you know, essentially walking through a little you know, archway with, without your keys. So there's got to be something much, much deeper going on here. And I think it, it, you know, it all kind of circles back around to you know, the importance of this, this, this one location in three different faiths. Okay, so you do think you kind of right right with me on that one that uh, there's something more here than the metal detector. I mean, I'm sorry. First of all, you mentioned mistrust. Well, I'm going to say it was mistrust when the Israeli police were attacked there. They were fatally mm-hmm. shot. Excuse me. If Basically, people who live in the neighboring region, and I'll say region, not country, because Palestine is not a recognized nation. Uh, But if your next door neighbor starts attacking you, you have the right to protect yourself. Lock the door, put up the metal detector. You have that right. Now... Going back a little bit in history, and you got a little bit better grip on the history than I do. The Temple Mount, and that's the host's preferred name because, well, I am Jewish. Get over it, folks. The Temple Mount lies in East Jerusalem. Now, Mm -hmm. didn't Israel win East Jerusalem in the 1967 war? Uh, Yeah, I believe so. They, They took control of that area. How many countries give back... Territory they won in war? You know, it's happened a handful of times, always accompanied with other uh, criteria, but it is pretty rare. Okay, then why, oh why, oh why? And maybe you can answer this because no one's been able to, so if you can't, I understand. Why does everybody want Israel to go back to their pre-1967 borders? Well, I think... Well, I don't, I don't claim to speak for, for everybody on this. I, I think a lot of it is, um, just in my in my opinion, mis- mistaken belief that going back to these pre-borders will will end or minimize the, the tensions. Um, you know, this idea of, of compromise, give people things, they're less likely to, to demand more. I, I think that's that's faulty personally, um, but I think that that kind of underlies a, a lot of people's reasoning for why they should go back to those borders. You know, they, they, they see the temple mounts, you know, and this, the, the six day war back in 67 as, um, I guess you would say, uh, an, an instigator of a lot of the, the current animosity and fighting that goes on there. And I, I believe what they're trying to argue is if we go back to those pre borders, you know, the fighting goes away. Personally, I don't, I don't see that as being the case. I think, this is there is something deeper going on there, but I believe that's where a lot of the argument comes from. All right, now we've got two different, more or less, factions in the Palestinians. There's more, I'm sure, but there's two big ones, aren't there? Yes. Palestinian Authority 
and Hezbollah. I think we both well, know Hamas. Or Hamas, sorry. I think we both know who's funding Hamas. Uh, yeah, I mean Hamas gets a lot of their funding uh from overseas, uh and in particular uh Iran, um as well as a lot of expats and uh a few other places as well. Now, one of the things I found rather appalling, and I'm going to sniff around real quick for, the, for an audio clip on this topic, but, uh, you know, we give hum, uh, humanitarian aid or something of the, some form of money to the Palestinian Authority. Mm-hmm. Now, what I haven't do? quite determined... Why? But I can see some of it. Oh, here it is. Now, here's something I found. The Palestinians do this, and I knew this, but I want, I want to bring it up, and you can give me your feedback. Ezra Schwartz was another American who was visiting Israel, and on November 19, 2015, Ezra was on his way back from a field trip with his schoolmates when he was shot and killed along with two others by Muhammad al karub another Palestinian terrorist. al karub was arrested, tried, and convicted, and is now serving four life sentences in prison. The Palestinian Authority pays al karub over $3,000 a month, every month. That's $40,000 a year for killing an innocent American. Yes, the Palestinian pays either the... The, the people that are imprisoned or the families of those who martyr themselves to injure American injure or kill Americans and Israelis. Now, I've also heard that the payments add up to about the, from the Palestinian Authority to the families and the, and the, the jailed people add up to almost the exact same dollar figure we give them in humanitarian aid. I don't know about that, how those match together, but they do have this fund that's uh, the Palestinian Authority Martyrs Fund that they put together like a monthly stipend to the families. I mean, wouldn't that encourage more people to become martyrs? It would, and it it does. I mean, I, I guess I can't say specifically that that specific payment does, but in general, we do know that terrorist groups use payments to families as as recruiting tools. Um, it's been used by by a whole variety of groups over the years, uh, not just as Islamist based as as well, but you know, pl- plenty of other ideologies too. That is a very common recruiting tactic, especially uh, in cases where the terrorist is on the front lines or suicide terror or those type of things, paying the families, taking care of the families plays a, plays a pretty large role in that. Uh, so it's not a huge leap to think that the Palestinian Authority doing this would also act as an incentive. Okay, so I'm not too far off my rocker in thinking that, wait a minute... If they stop paying these people and stop paying these families, or at least decrease the amount they're paying them, that maybe some of the violence would stop? People would be less inclined? Am I on the right track, or am I off my rocker here, Justin? Uh, I mean, that's certainly a a, a solid hypothesis. I don't see it happening. Uh, I mean, these, these payments are extraordinarily popular among the Palestinians. Um, I mean, they're almost universally supported in these, these stipends to families. Um, and, and they're, they're generally kind of pitched as you know, these families didn't do anything wrong. You know, they're a part of our people, uh, just part, part of the struggle. And, and so these, it's, it's not really pitched as we're, we're, we're paying people to commit acts of terror. Um, and so the Palestinian people are very, it's very popular among them and the government's not likely to, uh, to stop that process um, for fear of losing the people. Well, you know, I, for one, do not support paying people to blow themselves up. 
And yes, I understand it's the Palestinian welfare system, for lack of a term. But I think it's pretty crummy. All right. I got something light to end the show on, Justin. Prince okay. William what is, is it? Prince William is giving up his wings and flying for the final time with the East Angela Air Ambulance today. Prince Prince William today is his last day of work. William will cover a night shift. The Duke of Cambridge began piloting his first operational missions in July, July 2015 and has been based at Cambridge Airport as part of a team of specialists doctors, critical care paramedics, and pilots providing emergency medical services in the most dire of situations. So he's basically doing this, even though it's been, according to the statement released by Kensington Palace, he said, it's been a huge privilege to fly with the East Angela Air Ambulance, following on from my time in the military. I've had experience in this job I will carry with me for the rest of my life, and then will add a valuable perspective to my royal work for decades to come. Now, he's doing this because, well, Prince Philip announced his retirement earlier this year, and Queen Elizabeth mm-hmm. is no, no longer doing long-haul travel. So William and Princess Kate are going to focus full-time on royal duties. This decision also coincides with the plans to enroll Prince George at a full-time school in London, he had been attending a Montessori school near the couple's home. So, I just thought, you know, this guy served in his military, and I don't remember off the top of my head. Somebody would have to look it up for me, maybe you know, if military service is uh, required over in the UK. Uh, no, I don't believe it is. I didn't think it was either, but... So he served his country, then went on to work a regular job. To me, Mm -hmm. that settles a lot about his character, because you know, being a royal, he didn't have to work. Oh, absolutely not, yeah, especially as as a royal, that's, that's very impressive. So I thought that was an interesting note to end the show on, because, well... You know, I, as much as I can talk Iran, North Korea, the bombs and the terrorists all day long, Justin, and we have had many on and off air conversations that went on for quite some time. Sometimes you just got to relax and smell the roses. (laughs) Absolutely. You definitely do. All right, so, Justin, do you want to remind everybody where they can find you when you're not on air hanging out with me? Absolutely. Uh, so, again, I've got a Twitter account. That's Justin R underscore Kinney. Uh, you can absolutely reach me there anytime. And then I also have a Facebook page under my author name, which is J. Robert Kinney. And you can contact me there as well. And Kinney is spelled K-I-N-N-E-Y? It is. I cheated. I looked. So, on that note, folks, as a reminder, you can follow me on Twitter at Jesse's POV, and you can shoot me an email at the station, Jesse's POV at KLRNRadio.com. And for those of you authors looking to get on Coffee Shop, and I did check on your episode, Justin, we'll talk off the air in just a minute. You can email me at jesse at klrnradio.com, but if you grab the other email address, don't worry, I do check them both. And on that note, folks, you regulars know what's coming. You newbies, hang on for the ride. Um, ah!